In Chapter 2, we looked at water. We know now that water is essential for life, but it's not the only compound that is essential. And those are the compounds that we will be looking at in Chapter 3, the chemical building blocks of life. There are two branches of chemistry, inorganic and organic. Inorganic is based on any element other than carbon. Inorganic chemistry is the study of non-living chemistry. Organic chemistry is based on carbon, and it is the study of living chemistry. If you look at any living thing, you will see carbon, carbon, carbon everywhere. In addition to that, you'll see sulfur, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. There are other elements that will be found in living things, but these six elements are the most important. Central to these six is the carbon atom, and that's because it has unique bonding abilities that no other atom has. First, carbon is able to form four covalent bonds. No other element can do this. It is also able to bond to itself. Only the gases are able to do this. These two characteristics allow carbon to create compounds that appear to be unlimited in length, meaning we haven't found any limit yet, and it can create compounds that have a variety of shapes. They can come in straight chains, branched chains, circles, balls, tubes, and coils. You don't have to know the variety of shapes. You just need to know that all those possibilities are there. Each shape has its own physical and chemical properties. That's what's important to know. If you combine unlimited length and unlimited shape possibilities, you can end up with unlimited compound possibilities. And that's important because with an unlimited possibility of basic compounds, you have unlimited evolution. As we go through this chapter, you're going to hear me use the word macromolecule quite a bit. Macro just means large, so we're going to be talking about extremely large molecules. The basis for these extremely large molecules is the carbon-hydrogen bond. The carbon-hydrogen bond, which creates the carbon-hydrogen framework, is nonpolar, and that's because the electronegativities between carbon and hydrogen are similar, even though carbon is larger. Attached to the carbon-hydrogen framework are polar molecules called functional groups. The carbon-hydrogen framework has no real properties of its own because it's just the framework. Each functional group that attaches to it, however, has its own properties, and it passes those properties on to the carbon-hydrogen framework when they become attached. And so that framework goes from having no properties to the properties of its functional group. A carbon-hydrogen framework and the functional group that's attached to it is called a monomer. When you put monomers together, you get polymers or macromolecules. There are three types of functional groups. Hydroxyl, which is OH, amino, which is NH2, and phosphate, which is PO4. If you see the OH on the left and the NH2 in the middle, you'll see an R attached to it. That R is representative of the carbon-hydrogen framework. The hydroxyl groups will create molecules called alcohols. The amino groups will be used to create molecules called amino acids. And the phosphate we've talked about already and create molecules called phospholipids. The first macromolecule that we're going to look at are the carbohydrates, the carbs. They're composed mostly of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And there are three forms. We'll go through each one of them on their own. The first group of carbs we're going to look at are the monosaccharides. They're also called the simple sugars because they are monomers or single molecules. 
The most important of the monosaccharides are the five carbon sugars, ribose, which will be used in the backbone of RNA, and deoxyribose, which will be used in the backbone of DNA. And we'll be looking at the structures of both of those in future chapters. The sixth carbon sugar is glucose, and this is the primary energy storing unit for all living things. It's created during photosynthesis in plants, and it's used again and again as we move up and down the trophic pyramid. Plants and animals will use it to create energy by breaking it down through cellular respiration. We'll talk about this and photosynthesis extensively in later chapters as well. The second group of carbs we're going to look at are the disaccharides. A disaccharide is a glucose molecule bonded to a second type of sugar. For example, fructose, which makes sucrose, and galactose, which makes lactose. This is done to transport the glucose throughout the body. Glucose is a very fragile molecule, which means that it will break down to energy wherever it's sitting. So what the body does is it turns it into a disaccharide, transports it to wherever it needs to be, then breaks it down back into glucose, and then breaks the glucose back down again into the sugar's energy that the organism needs. The most common of the disaccharides are sucrose, which is on the left, and lactose, which is on the right. Sucrose, as I said, is created when glucose is bonded to fructose. This is the transport form that most plants use, and we know it as table sugar. Lactose is created when glucose is bonded to galactose. This is called milk sugar because it's the sugar found in mother's milk. Adults or children that don't have enough of the enzyme to break lactose apart efficiently are said to be lactose intolerant. The last group of carbs are the polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are long chains of monosaccharides bonded together. And they have three different functions. The first is the potato at the left, and that's starch. Starch is used for long-term storage of energy. Starches are insoluble in water, which is one reason that they stay for so long in storage. When the bonds are broken between the glucose molecules during digestion, the energy within the glucose is made available to the organism. The second form is cellulose, and this is used for cellular structures in plants like plant walls. Cellulose is what keeps the plant standing up, and it's that long stringy stuff in the celery that's in the picture. Cellulose isn't easily broken down. Animals like cows and deer have special bacteria or specialized digestive systems that do the breaking down for them. The last is chitin. Chitin, when combined with protein, forms the hard shells of bugs and crustaceans. Our next group of molecules are the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. These molecules are called nucleic acids because they are found within the nucleus of each cell. DNA, of course, provides the genetic information that the organisms need to survive, and RNA carries the mechanisms to create the proteins and other molecules that are needed by the body and described by the DNA. As I said at the beginning, we will talk about DNA and RNA extensively. So what you need to know in this chapter is just that DNA carries the genetic code of the organism. It's the source of everything that happens within that organism, including appearance, abilities, and behaviors. DNA is created from long chains of subunits called nucleotides. Each nucleotide is composed of a deoxyribose sugar, that five carbon sugar I mentioned earlier, a phosphate group, which is that functional group I mentioned earlier, and a nitrogen base. RNA converts the information from the DNA into the correct sequences that are needed 
to make the proteins that the body will use. RNA is also composed of nucleotides. The difference is it has the ribose sugar. Nucleotides are also important in creating ATP. We mentioned that briefly in a couple other chapters, the energy that the cell actually uses. And NAD and FAD, these are electron carriers that are also involved in the creation of cellular energy. We will talk extensively about ATP, NAD, and FAD when we talk about cellular respiration and photosynthesis. The most varied group of macromolecules are the proteins. There are seven categories and we will go through each of them. The first category are the enzymes. They increase or decrease the rate of a chemical reaction. That is called catalysis. We have an entire chapter on enzymes, so I'm only going to give you an example for this chapter. When we eat food, hydrochloric acid is released into the stomach to begin to break those food particles down. The process of breaking those particles down with just hydrochloric acid is very slow. So slow that we would not be able to use that energy and we would actually starve. What really happens is the hydrochloric acid activates an enzyme called pepsin. Pepsin increases the digestion of the food and brings glucose to us faster to the point where we can immediately access that energy if we need it. The defense proteins are the proteins that form the basis for the body's immune system and will protect the body against bacteria, viruses, and other foreign invaders. We will look at the immune system in great detail at the end of the year when we look at that particular chapter. We've discussed the transport proteins a little already when we looked at the plasma membrane. The transmembrane proteins moved molecules into and out of the cell through the cell membrane. They also move molecules around the body. For example, hemoglobin allows oxygen to be moved throughout the body while attached to the blood. Support molecules create structures that give shape to molecules. Collagen makes the matrix for tendons, ligaments, skin, and bones. Keratin makes hair fibers, and fibrin creates the structures that make blood clots. Hormones are chemicals created in one part of the body that control functions in another part. For example, the growth hormone is created in the pituitary gland near the brain. That hormone is then sent throughout the body so that the body grows in entirety instead of in just small portions. Hormones also send messages from one cell to another so the body can respond properly. For example, fight or flight. When something scares you, adrenaline goes throughout the body and prepares it to either run or to fight. The last hormone are storage hormones. There are some molecules that the body needs, such as calcium and iron, that need to be stored for future use. The only way they can be stored is if they are bonded to storage proteins. Our last group of macromolecules are called the lipids. This is a very large group that is generally defined as those that are insoluble in water. Lipids form membranes, which we talked about when we talked about the phospholipid bilayer, and they store energy. Fats have twice as many carbon-hydrogen bonds than carbs do, so they store about two and a half times more energy. Energy that isn't immediately used by an organism, whether it's a plant or an animal, is converted into a lipid. That lipid is an oil in plants or fat in animals. People get fat because we consume more energy than our body uses, so we store it as fat for later times. Oils 
are the same thing in plants. They have more energy than the plant needs, and so it's stored as oil in case lean times come. We harvest that oil and use it in the form of, say, corn oil and olive oil. The last part of this chapter is how some of those nutrients are cycled through our system. And we're going to look at carbon and nitrogen. This is the assignment that you did over the summer. Carbon cycling is the movement of carbon into and out of the Earth's ecosystems. Carbon enters the cycle as carbon dioxide, CO2, from the atmosphere. It goes into plants and other photosynthetic organisms, which convert it into glucose during photosynthesis. This is called carbon fixation because it fixes gaseous carbon into a solid form. CO2 and HCO3, which is called bicarbonate, are used by aquatic plants during photosynthesis. They also bring carbon into the system in the same way as plants on land do. Animals incorporate this carbon into their cells by eating the plants. Carbon is released from the cycle by breathing out CO2 during respiration. This is done by both plants and animals. It's also released after death. As the plants and animals decay, they release more carbon dioxide and methane, CH4. A third way to release carbon into the atmosphere is fossil fuels. When fossil fuels are burned, again, CO2 is created. That allows all that CO2 to go back into the atmosphere and to re-enter the cycle. Nitrogen cycling begins with nitrogen gas, N2. It's also found in the atmosphere, is brought into the system through prokaryotes that are living in the soil or in a symbiotic relationship with peas and beans. These prokaryotes turn nitrogen into NH3, ammonia. This is nitrogen fixation. So again, a gaseous nitrogen is turned into a solid nitrogen. The ammonia is converted into NO3, nitrate. This is called nitrification by a different group of prokaryotes. The ammonia and the nitrate is taken up by plants as nutrients. That nitrogen is again transferred from the plants to the animals when the animals eat the plants. Nitrogen leaves the cycle as ammonia, which is released into the soil or into the water through animal waste. When ammonia is converted into nitrate and then back into nitrogen gas by soil bacteria and other microbes. Once the ammonia and the nitrogen gas are created, they're released back into the air and the cycle begins again. This completes Chapter 3, The Chemical Building Blocks of Life or Macromolecules.